Thank you, Co-Chair Grant. Uh, and I'd like to thank you very much for having me this afternoon. I'm well aware of the many demands on your attention this spring and I'm grateful for your consideration from Domain. Would particularly like to thank you and Co-Chair McGuire for their leadership along with the rest of the cross-party group on commercial sexual exploitation. Particularly thank Ms. Martin for that uh, deeply in inspiring, inspiring remark. Uh, as we've explored so far this afternoon, the online ecosystems that fuel sexual exploitation are a grave and complex challenge for Scotland, and indeed every nation, and I hope our perspective from Child Safe AI as a tech startup with a quantitative approach to countering human trafficking will be useful for you as you consider how to address this problem domain. Uh, for my part, I'd like to ask you for, for 10 minutes to Supplement the perspectives you've heard so far today by considering some of the common misconceptions around the economics that drive sex trafficking. Many unfamiliar with this problem domain might assume that sex trafficking is a sex crime, and it is not. It is an economic crime of opportunity. Traffickers are motivated by the rapid and effortless acquisition of wealth. That is the end. The means is commoditizing the vulnerability of our youth. That vulnerability is so commoditized by connecting vulnerable kids with buyers purchasing sex for profit, often online. And it's important to understand how vast that profit is. A misconception we often hear is that the money involved in this illicit economy is less than other illicit economies like narcotics or weapons or counterfeit goods. The International Labor Organization's estimate is that $99 billion a year in profit, not revenue, profit is made per year from sex trafficking. For reference, you would have to combine the annual profit from Apple, Microsoft, Google, IBM, Cisco, General Electric, Disney, Boeing, Coca-Cola, and Toyota, and you still would not equal the profit of sex trafficking globally. You'd have to add the net transfer spend on players for both Chelsea and Manchester United for the past 20 years to eclipse the amount of profit sex trafficking generates. There's no buying supply in sex trafficking. You compel it through force, fraud, and coercion. When you sell a kilo of cocaine, eventually you run out of cocaine and you have to buy more. A victim of human trafficking is monetized again and again and again without end. Another misconception is that the commercial sex market is symmetric like other illicit markets, and it is not. As one study cited in the inquiry reveals, substantially more men want to buy sex than women want to sell sex. Indeed, the number of women who want to sell sex remains constant regardless of whatever public policy or law enforcement strategy is regulating. Whether commercial sex is illegal or illegal, whether a commercial sex provider is arrested one time or 20 times, there's no appreciable impact on the amount of supply. There are only three factors that cause meaningful changes in the supply for commercial sex. One, poverty, two, natural disaster, or three, open warfare. No public or law enforcement policy has de demonstrated meaningful change to the amount of supply. Both are, however, governing dynamics for the demand. And as the current scholarship finds, the legalization status of purchase of sex, the perceived risk of arrest or personal harm, the accessibility of supply, ease of transaction, and price all have profound influence on the decision to purchase sex. These are retail purchases affected by retail dynamics in stark contrast to the supply. So when it is legal to buy, when there is no risk of arrest, and all the available supply is on a 24-hour website where all one needs to do is send a text message in order to transact, the number of men willing to buy sex rises. I had a harder time buying toothbrushes on Amazon this week than a sex buyer has in Scotland right now. The difference between commercial sex and narcotics or weapons or counterfeit goods is when the demand rises, the supply does not. More men wanting to buy sex does not attract more women who want to sell it. That economic asymmetry is fundamental to the business proposition of sex trafficking. An analogy often made here in the United States is that with the sudden change in the public policy and law enforcement strategies around marijuana, when an extrinsic regulatory event like legalization suddenly creates millions more marijuana consumers, producers just grow more marijuana. But you can't grow more commercial sex providers. However, with the right economic incentive, this dramatic asymmetry between two sides of the market, a hardened criminal element will forcibly acquire the supply. And what that looks like was powerfully and courageously articulated by Ms. Barton earlier. If you're going to combat a horrific 
criminal enterprise fueled by macroeconomics these fast and stark, you have to use a macroeconomic approach. You have to do something about the distribution and you have to do something about the demand. The distribution in this case, like the rest of the global economy is online. These websites, traffickers leverage, uh, these websites are what traffickers leverage to connect to buyers and they are vital to the attractiveness of the business model. These websites represent low startup cost. There's no buying a kilo of Coke for 20,000 pounds. Just a SIM card and an ad will net you 10 transactions a day. They represent ultra cheap marketing. Ads can be as low as five, to five pounds or they can be as high as 1,300 pounds, cheaper than classified advertising in phone books or periodicals. They represent convenience, no peddling contraband on street corners. In fact, with the right language in the ad, the buyers literally come to you and they represent market access. In 2021, these websites are where all the sex buyers go. In 2018, the United States made a meaningful attempt at disrupting that distribution of these websites. The first piece was a law enforcement action seizing the market leading advertising site called Backpage. The second piece was passing legislation making similar enterprises criminally and civilly liable for sex trafficking that occurs on them. While it will remain some time for the scholarship to fully quantify the direct relationship between these actions, sex trafficking, uh, and that scholarship will be further complicated by global macroeconomic events like the pandemic, we can observe in the 22 months between these two actions and the pandemic that there were some early indications of the effect of this disruption of distribution. First, we see that a similarly sized advertising website has not emerged as a victor. Similar to what happened with narcotics marketplaces on the dark web after the seizure of the Silk Road, commercial sex advertising in the United States remains fragmented with 30 to 40 websites competing at any, different time, at any given time for different geographies, different demographies, and different market segments in the United States. Another site with the market share of Backpage has not popped back up. Second, commercial sex marketplaces did not migrate to the dark web. Dark web marketplaces that already existed before April 2018 did not see a significant uptick in advertising volumes. Providers and buyers both report in online commercial sex forums that surface web venues like dedicated commercial sex websites or consumer social media like Twitter remain the preferred distribution media for advertising. And no buyer, provider or buyer is reporting a dark web marketplace as having higher transaction volume than a surface web marketplace for consumer social media. Speed, ease of use, technical complexity, and critically, mobile device compatibility appear to be the driving factors here. This remains a retail market with a retail consumer expectation that the dark web cannot deliver. Third, buyer traffic and legitimate advertising volume is down significantly. For the leading advertising websites before the pandemic, unique visitorship individually remained 92 to 94% lower than Backpage was at its height. Providers are indicating they are receiving lower yield for advertisement and buyers are indicating that they have to pour through eight to 10 spam advertisements in order to find one that is legitimate. Both indicate on commercial sex forums that the market appears to be overall smaller. Fourth, website operators appear to be making dramatically less money. According to the superseding indictment, Backpage was making $150 million per year in advertising revenue before it was seized. And the indictment for City X Guide, another website that was seized under the previously mentioned legislation, prosecutors allege it was making 20 million per year, an 87% delta in revenue. Website operators are making less money. Finally, the price of commercial sex rose in the United States, and this is a significant macroeconomic observation. In our view, this is the most significant uh, effect that we can observe. Markets where uh, the rate for commercial sex were $100, $100 to $150 per hour, are now commonly commanding $300 to $400 per hour. And there are a few reasons why this might be. The first is the most optimistic. Buyers uh, often refer to $100 to $150 as quote unquote back page prices. It is possible that a significant amount of traffic labor in the market exited, leaving consenting supply charging higher rates. The second is the Econ 101 argument. As supply falls, prices rise. This argument suggests that the total number of providers of commercial sex fell resulting in higher prices. The third possibility is widespread collusion. Uh, this suggests that the supply for commercial sex is coordinating nationwide price fixing. This doesn't seem as likely as, uh, 
this doesn't seem as likely uh, as the uh, uh, rise in prices did not appear to be localized geography geographically, but it is possible. Uh, and the last is that increased marketing costs are passed to the consumer with more advertising sites, there are more fees. Uh, and as a consequence, providers must charge more. And this is possible, but the unit economics that they're charging appear to outpace the additional advertising costs an individual provider is likely to incur. The costs of the advertising are still lower than the amount of increase in their hourly rate. It's certainly our hope that this event uh, continues to be the subject of rigorous research in the future. And these preliminary findings should not be interpreted as peer-reviewed scholarship, but we can conclude that many of the predictions of the market effects of distribution disruption did not come to fruition in the United States. If you're fighting a distribution crime, which sex trafficking is, you need to disrupt distribution channels. And the early data suggests that this is an important component of any counter-trafficking strategy. No, I'm up on my time. Uh, so to conclude, I'd like to thank you for your consideration and ask you for another favor. If you're a policymaker, if you're law enforcement, if you're a journalist, or if you're a concerned Scott who cares about this issue, today, please go to punternet.com. This site is the oldest review board in the UK, and it's a buyer-owned and buyer-operated social network where the demand for commercial sex is most popular in Scotland. What you're gonna see is graphic, but it's needed for you to understand the demand in this market. There are three sides to every market, the supply, the distribution, and the demand. We don't have enough time in this setting uh, to talk more about the demand. However, I, instead, I'd like you to see them for yourself. Any web browser, just go to punternet.com and read what the buyers have to say about what they describe as this hobby. I think it will illuminate the dynamics that govern their purchase decisions. And by way of encouragement, I'd like to conclude with a quotation from a similar forum in the United States following a sex trafficking bust that made the news in a local market. This buyer on this forum says, it's up to you, the customer, to realize the properties of a place when you provide your patronage. You should have ethics you should be following, your own ethics. Just because you buy the Tyson chicken and it's chicken, doesn't make it ethical. Once you eat that chicken, you're eating growth hormones and contributing to a culture of treating chickens poorly, making living things with feelings into nothing but a profit turning machine with no actual life. As the consumer, it's up to you to make sure the chicken came from an ethical source that repaid its sacrifice with a good life. Screen your chicken, make sure you're buying organic free range and that you can at least be morally ethically sound in your judgment of its setting and condition. This is a sex buyer describing the women he's transacting with as chicken. You have it in your ability to control how many of these men your local economy is producing. And I thank you for bearing that in consideration as you confront this complex problem domain.